We are live and in the uh, we're a little bit of a scramble behind the scenes through no fault of Dave's. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome uh, to the webinar. Uh, I am Mark Rabin from Kinexus. We are joined by Dave Kippen, who's had to jump through some hoops because he is having internet problems at home. He had to drive to an undisclosed location where he has better cell signal. We are uh, we're going to give it a try. And if there are problems because of the cell signal, we will uh, pull the end on cord and we will do a recording when technical conditions are, are better and we will send that recording um, out to everybody. So um, first off, Dave, we'll do a quick sound check. How are you? <laughs> All things considered. All things considered, I'm doing well. What a good practice for what I'm about to share with the, with the guests. We'll, we'll, we'll hear from you today about mindfulness and leading lean, and then during Q&A, or at some point, maybe you can share some reflections on if mindfulness practice um, helped you during what I think we'd all recognize to be a stressful situation here today. So again, thank you for um, doing your best to, uh, to make this work out today. So again, today's topic is mindfulness and leading lean presented by Dave Kippen. Uh, Dave, uh, for the past 15 years, or actually more than that, Dave has served as a lean leader, a change agent, a coach, and an educational instructor. Over the past three years, Dave has been on a journey around meditation and mindfulness, which has helped deepen his passion for improving the human condition on our beautiful planet, as he calls it. Dave's passion is to aid in the development of leadership and growth through all levels of the organization. Over this time, he's coached more than 250 people through different lean classes. He's facilitated over 100 Kaizen events throughout the U.S. and Europe. And as he describes, Dave's ultimate goal is to help end workplace suffering. Um, that's a great goal. By making the workplace a little more engaging, fun, and meaningful for employees at all levels. And Dave is bronze certified through um, the SME, AME, Shingo Prize, ASQ, um, partnership. And I also want to acknowledge, um, I had a, a chance to meet Dave and, and he did a different version of session on this topic at the Michigan Lean Consortium annual conference. So I want to give a shout out to our friend, my friends back in the state of Michigan, where Dave is joining us from today. <laughs> um, so with that, let me turn it over to you, Dave. All right. Yeah. Uh, a snowy state of Michigan today. And my wife texted just before I get on a, a huge very widespread outage of internet. So it really wasn't me <laughs> yeah. as much as I thought it might be, but uh, it's almost like the universe is testing us today. So, uh, hey, we can handle it, right? I think Thanks you're up for to that the great test. introduction, Mark. Yeah, that was, that was awesome. It's always awkward to hear about yourself, <laughs> but I appreciate it. And again, thanks for the opportunity uh, for letting me share just a little bit of what I've learned over the last uh, handful of years, um, you know, with the folks that follow you. Uh, I tried to go back, Mark, to find one of my early versions of Leader Standard Work, because I remember one of my weekly tasks was to read several of the lean blogs as I was an up-and-coming continuous improvement practitioner, uh, and yours was on it. So you've been, whether you knew it or not, part of my life for quite a while. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, okay, so let's get into it. Um, this is the agenda. So a little bit uh, about how we got here today. Why am I even talking about this? Uh, so I'll give just a brief, uh, the brief history. And then I like to start out with what mind mindfulness is not. Uh, lots of preconceived notions, I think, out there about mindfulness. So hopefully I can clear some of those up. And then really the three tenets that we'll get into uh, that I found the most crossover between continuous improvement leadership and, and mindfulness, presence, equanimity, uh, and impermanence. So we'll dig a little deeper into each of those. And then finally, some references. So if anybody wants to start their journey and doesn't know where, uh, I'll offer up a couple of options there. You can see the picture there. Uh, several years ago, we bought our first camper and uh, the first time I had to learn how to empty the septic tank, <laughs> a good test of mindfulness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just a little bit about my path, how we got here. Uh, as Mark mentioned, I've been in the continuous improvement and leadership space for quite a while now. Uh, the years keep ticking away. And I've always felt I've done a decent job at being a good human being uh, in the workplace. Uh, no one called me a jerk, at least to my face, so that was good. 
But several years ago, I realized that there were some things perhaps outside of work that uh, maybe were below the line where I wanted to, to be, right? Somebody pulls out in front of you in traffic, uh, and your mind takes you to a space that is, is silly once you look back on it, overreacting to things, getting overly uh, wound up, worrying about the past or, or the future. So like any good continuous improvement person, I thought, well, what can I learn? Uh, and I came across mindfulness. Um, it's interesting. I, I came across and I started this journey to improve my uh, my headspace outside of work, uh, which it has, but obviously it's come full circle back to work <laughs> since that's what I'm kind of talking about here. So first caveat, everything I talk about is applicable anywhere, work, home, uh, and everywhere in between. Why should you keep listening? You know, if that resonates with anybody, you know, if uh, uh, occasionally you react to something in a way that's uh, maybe not how you want it to, some of these tools and techniques will definitely help, whether it be at work, in the conference room, in the boardroom, at the kitchen table at home. So we'll start what uh, uh, mindfulness, what it's not. So on the left-hand side, uh, I like to start, it's not, at least the, the where I'm coming from, it's not religious. There's no religious uh, undertones to this. Obviously, a lot of the mindfulness Mindfulness teachings come from some Eastern practice. Uh, what I'm going to share with uh, Mark, with you and everybody listening, has nothing to do with religion. I know sometimes that's a little sticky wicket, and I like to start with that. Everything I'm going to talk through is experiential. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the mindfulness practices, they encourage you to test it for yourself, right? Everything I'm going to say today is something you can experience on your own without trusting Dave with blind faith. <laughs> Please, God, don't do that. <laughs> Uh, you can test it on your own. SpongeBob there, he's telling us that really mindfulness is not just about being happy. I think sometimes people think uh, the term mindfulness is all about uh, joy and living in the moment in a positive way, and it's really not. Uh, and it'd be a spoiler if I told you why not yet, um, but it's not about just being happy. The other two pictures, you know, I've never spent uh, a week in a cave <laughs> anywhere in. Nepal. I've never been to an enchanted forest, uh, and most of us have not. And you don't need to have done any of those things to experience some of the benefits that, that I've seen over the years. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you guys can experience over the next weeks and months and years yourself. So I like the level set with that. And again, Mark, at any point, if you want to hop in with questions, this really, there's no formal Q&A for this one, but uh, anytime, just let me know. Okay. Will do. All right, mindfulness, uh, what it is, and I, I caveat there as well, at least what I know it is today. <laughs> I will not claim to be the expert, obviously. Um, I don't know everything, but I've learned enough where I felt like I really wanted to start sharing it with people to help them on their own journeys. Um, one of the first crossovers I've noticed between folks that teach mindfulness and meditation, those types of things, and continuous improvement folks, you know, the more the more I learn, the less I understand, or whatever the old quote is, right? You'll hear folks that have been practicing mindfulness for 20 years and say they're just now taking their first step. And I hear that a lot in the continuous improvement and, and hopefully the leadership space if a leader realizes there's a lot more to learn. So again, I don't know it all. There's probably folks on the call that know more than I do about mindfulness, and that's great. And I hope you connect with me afterwards and let me know uh, Let me know your thoughts on this. So three things. Mindfulness is really about a true reflection on what's going on around you right now in the moment. So what's happening in your space? You know, Mark, in the immediate space where you're sitting, all of our listeners, what's happening? Uh, in the space around you, you know, not next door, not across the country, <laughs> um, right there with you. And so we'll spend some time talking about that, experiencing that. Uh, the second bit uh, that I think mindfulness is, uh, really this is what excites me perhaps more than the others is examining what's happening inside your own skin real time. 
right? It's really a curiosity journey as much as any other type of journey. And I think that also resonates a lot in the continuous improvement space. Uh, lately, you hear a lot of um, a lot of discussion about experiments and curiosity and, and always have that child's mindset, you know, is a word that we've been using a lot lately. And then the three uh, tenants that, again, I'll talk about, and these were in the agenda, uh, kind of presence, equanimity, and impermanence, uh, where those overlap is, is what we're looking at, examining what's going on, really mostly in between our ears up here. I do have a bottom line, if you will, on this slide. Uh, and these are my words. Uh, the ability to experience the causes of joy and of suffering. I know the word suffering has some baggage. So if you see that here or in other slides, when you hear the word suffering, just think uh, stress, anger, you know, all those kind of negative feelings. That's we just ball those up into the word suffering. So the ability to experience the causes of joy, happiness, suffering, stress, anxiety, those kinds of things. Imagine if we could get to the point where before we're joyous or before we're suffering, <laughs> we see it coming, right? Mm. We experience it. Okay, so we'll dig in. Uh, the first of the three tenets that I talked through is really foundational um, to the rest, and it's presence. I think presence is a buzzword these days. Um, I doubt there's a person listening here that hasn't thought about, ah, I should be more present. Oh, I wish so-and-so were more present, <laughs> right? It's a, it's a very common uh, desire, if you will, these days. I think I'm going to take us a little deeper into presence uh, and what it means from the mindfulness uh, perspective. And the way we use it is uh, presence is really noticing the raw data of the current moment. I've got a little graphic there on the left. So the raw data of the current moment, and this is where I would ask for the chat. <laughs> you know, what's that mean to you? You know, the graphic kind of gives it away, but uh, uh, feel free in the chat to type when you hear the, the term raw data of the current moment. What does that conjure up in your mind? I mean, as we're waiting for chat to come in, I mean, I you're making me think of connections to going to the Gemba. Like, what's the real reality? Not what data might be telling us. Um, there's a comment from Catherine, what my body is experiencing. Dan says sights, sounds, smells, right? Our senses. Yeah. Yeah, love it. And anything and that's coming in, anything coming in through senses, paying attention to all of our senses, a couple other comments that came in. Yeah. So those are all spot on. And Mark, what you said is spot on too. And you've shifted us to the right side of the A3. <laughs> CI joke, to the right side Sorry of the Sorry to jump ahead. <laughs> um yeah, mindfulness, you know, the raw data of the moment, it's exactly what uh, some of the, the learners mentioned. It senses and what's going on in our head as far as thoughts. So we're going to run a, we'll run an experiment. We'll do an activity um, where we test this for ourselves. So wherever you're at, whether it's a parking lot at a Speedway gas station <laughs> yeah. or your home office or, or work office, uh, I'm going to lead us through just a, a quick uh guided observations. I won't call it meditation. I don't want to turn anybody off, uh, but some guided observations to help us understand presence, maybe at a little deeper level. Okay. Again, eyes open, eyes shut, doesn't matter. First thing I'll have you guys do with eyes open, uh, just notice what's in front of you. What's your immediate field of view? Maybe what's there that you haven't seen or thought about in a while. Okay. 
We'll run through a couple of these and we'll do a quick reflection. Um, somebody chatted a comment, a snowy landscape. <laughs> Another Michigander, maybe. It must be a Michigander. Yeah. Yeah. Good. We'll do a next one. We'll, uh, it'll be a, um, uh, external touch sensation. So if you've got a beverage in front of you, go ahead and take a sip. If you don't, grab a pen or a pencil and just jot your name down. Go ahead and take a sip or jot your name down. Now let me ask a couple of questions. If you took a sip, where did the glass or the container touch your lips first? Top lip, bottom lip? Have you ever thought about that in your entire life? <laughs> if you didn't have anything to drink and you want it and you jotted your name down, which finger had the most pressure on the pen or pencil? And have you ever thought about that? <laughs> so we actually have people who responded. One person who, like me, was bottom lip, but I had to go back and test that um, if I was aware of the real reality. And then someone else said top lip. And I think none of us have noticed that before. Very interesting. Good. With the writing, a couple, somebody said index finger, and yes, they have noticed this. Maybe there's a callus on their finger. Um, <laughs> someone, else, someone else said middle finger. Somebody writes a lot. <laughs> Good. The third one, we'll just sit qual quietly and we'll use our uh, two ears. So just listen to what's happening around you. I hear a little hum of uh, some road noise down below the building I'm in, which I normally wouldn't notice. I guess it's become, it's almost white noise. That's right. Lots of times there's all kinds of sounds uh, that people to your point, uh, they, they fall away to the background, they become white noise. And, and people are hearing things, muffled voices, raindrops, snoring bulldogs, <laughs> mom, mom filing nails in the other room, refrigerator opening and closing. Hopefully, but thankfully, you hear both sounds or you have to run and check. Clock ticking, manufacturing sounds, laptop fan, heater blasting. Huh. Yeah. Dog reggae music on YouTube at low volume to keep the dogs calm while I'm attending the webinar. <laughs> I love it. Ah. Awesome. And then the final experiment we'll run through is what's going on inside of our body, right? So just take a breath. You don't have to take a big inhale or anything fancy. And then let it exhale. And then let's see if we can find some sensations. Lots of times uh, a heartbeat or a buzzing in the chest. Oftentimes people will feel that same buzzing or some sensations in the hands, even if they're not moving, just wherever your hands are resting. I feel a crick in my neck that I wanted to resolve by moving it to the side a little bit. Someone else is feeling or hearing tinnitus, feeling relaxation in my neck and back. Well, that's good. I can feel the pressure on my right hand as I sort of lean on my standing desk a little bit, which maybe isn't a good practice. So I will, <laughs> stand. I will just stand. That's great. That's great. And again, thanks, Mark, for reading the chats. I, I apologize mm -hmm. to put you in that position, oh, but uh, quite, I do appreciate right. it. So that's good. That's a fun activity. Um, and I challenge Mark, you and the group. These are always available to us every minute of every day. All that's there. And again, I didn't do taste or smells or anything like that. We are being bombarded with raw data of the current moment. And you said it very astutely earlier. It's almost all white noise at this point. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that is? So maybe this is a question to, to Mark, to you or to the chat. Why is the current moment? Why has it faded into the background? What do we think? I mean, my, my first answer is that maybe it just prevents our brain from being overwhelmed, overloaded. Someone else says a million things going on, distractions. <laughs> yeah. Competing priorities, yeah. chaos all yeah. around. Sorry to hear. 
Yeah, all that's true. Excellent observations. Uh, there is an evolutionary part of it, right, where you just can't focus on everything all the time. And I'm not, so maybe I should be clear, I'm not saying that I want you to start <laughs> sensing everything you can possibly sense every second of every day. Um, that's really not the point here. Um, but it will build into the, okay, so what section here next? Mm -hmm. And I think this is the piece that people don't connect with presence. In the rare moments where I can focus on the current moment, a breath, a sensation, a feeling, what can't I also be doing? Anybody in the chat? Uh, worrying, other things. Yeah. Surfing your phone. Yep. Unconsciously reacting. Yep. Unconsciously, just to emphasize. Yep. And I think that is the power of presence that never gets spoken about. When I'm able to be truly present and understanding what's happening in the moment, I can't be worried about the future and I can't be fretting about the past. Mm -hmm. I can only be accepting what's happening right now. So when you uh, hear, you know, folks that suffer from from stress and anxiety, that's why a lot of times, you know, uh, meditation and mindfulness come up because it truly is, although it's sh short lived, it is an antidote, right? It's absolutely an antidote. I want to go. I want to start a crusade, and maybe uh, Mark, you and the listeners can help me. You know, when people are getting worked up, it's always. Uh, take a breath, take a breath, Mark, take a breath. I want to change that to feel a breath. We're all going to take a breath anyway. <laughs> we don't have a choice. Feel the breath, right? So that's my first challenge to the to the team here. Uh, next time you want to offer uh, some advice to somebody and, you're, and you want to say, you know, take a breath, challenge them to feel the breath. What's it feel like? Where does the breath hit their nose and their mouth? How does the chest feel? Because that will bring them to the immediate moment. And at least for that brief amount of time, things will fall away. Now, I, I will jump in real quick. When Dave and I got on the phone, when he first reported his internet trouble to me, not that I sensed you weren't breathing, Dave, but almost reflexively, I did say, well, it's okay. Take a breath. We'll figure it out. And yeah. 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 Good point. <laughs> on feeling a breath. Yeah. You were probably yeah. doing that. Take a breath is good. Feel the breath is better. All right, so how does this translate to continuous improvement in leadership? And I've only got one uh, one thing up here that I'll share, um, but maybe in the chat, uh, Mark, uh, you feel free to chime in. All that stuff I just went through, uh, how does that translate in your your opinion or the team's opinion to continuous improvement in, in leadership? I'm curious to see what responses come in because I had jotted down a question that I knew you were actually, you were getting to here of how does this connect? How does it help us? So we have some comments coming in listening, slowing down, relishing the moment and focusing, taking the time, paying attention, listening and understanding what is being asked. And what, so one thought that comes to mind for me is trying to back to this phrase, the real reality, instead of assuming. I assumed maybe, Dave, that you were really stressed out about the internet thing. I could have asked a question first to gauge that real reality instead of assuming. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, very fair. All good comments. Um, presence, equanimity, um, and transience are all related. So some of those will come back up again. So, so excellent uh, work there. Uh, the way I'll share it here, and again, uh, lots of crossovers, but in 40 minutes, I can only share so much. Um, one, another way to think about this is, you know, leading and lagging indicators. And so if we get better, well, here, let me, I have my hypothesis here. If we can get better at being present, truly understanding the current moment, we'll choose a better path forward, right? Our body, our senses, and being present can be a leading indicator of what our mouth might do next. I've learned this the hard way plenty of times. <laughs> um, 
if we can be in the moment, again, we're not worrying about the past or fretting about the future. So my hypothesis is we'll make better choices. One quick story to support this, um, uh, and then a quick Q&A and we'll move on. Uh, part of my role is we lead continuous improvement teams. We teach and coach uh, the people doing the work on how to improve their own work. And one of our continuous improvement teams, it was a safety team. Uh, and the team had appointed a, a young team lead, right? He had never, he didn't have any formal leadership um, uh, positional authority in the plant. And so this was kind of his first chance to lead the team. One of his first big report outs, so they did their first uh, project, they reduced some risk in the plant. Uh, and his job was to report out to, you know, the plant leadership and some others on it. And we were sitting in the conference room and, and he started his report out uh, and it was a little rocky. Um, he, he wasn't delivering the message that I wanted him to deliver, right? Because it was a pretty cool project and he just wasn't there. And I felt myself wanting to do something about it, jumping in, saving this poor kid, you know, all these things that we've all done a hundred times. <laughs> but I didn't, I stopped and I just sat there and I just enjoyed the fact that he was experiencing his first report out. And wouldn't you know it, by the time he was done, he'd said everything I would have said anyway. <laughs> huh. So this idea of just being present, sensing that I wanted to do something and then not doing it yeah, was really powerful. He did a great job. Okay, so that's presence. We got a little bit of time uh, for Q&A, not a ton of time, but if there's a question out there, I'm happy to answer it. Well, one, one question I was going to ask, and again, I'll invite people to submit those during um, Q&A. You use the word suffering and almost apologize for it because that word, like maybe it feels a bit strong. Yeah. But is there, and you, and you explained, well, it could mean other negative emotions, but is, is there kind of an origin in the literature or, you know, that that you chose the word suffering? Is that a word that does get used in this context yeah. a lot? Yeah, yeah. You know, in the Eastern teachings, that is the word. Uh, the, the word is suffering. Um, you know, uh, to be alive is to suffer is kind of the the, the short uh, and sweet version of where some of the teachings start, which just means to be human is to feel emotions, right? To be stressed and be angry and be sad and, and be all those things. So the, the word suffering is really the original catch-all <laughs> for our emotional woes. Somebody commented one of the four noble truths in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. but I think we've all used the phrase, not here, but, you know, uh, oh, we really suffered through that meeting. <laughs> exactly. It does get said in the workplace sometimes. Good. Yep. Okay. The second of the three tenets that we'll touch on is equanimity. Um, roughly translated or meaning being able to balance our emotions uh, or not react. Boy, wouldn't that be nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can see why presence is first. Step one is I have to realize that I'm about to react <laughs> or that I have reacted. Uh, and now equanimity comes in and says, what are we going to do about it? The image on the left there uh, represents what we call feeling tones. And so this is uh, hardwired into us. Anytime stimulus comes at us, an email, a thought, a word, a picture, as a human, we automatically assign it a feeling tone, unpleasant, pleasant, or neutral. We do it without thinking. We do it in the first half of a second of a stimulus coming to us. And then that drives us uh, in some direction after that. And again, this is evolutionary. I mean, our brains were designed to keep us alive, uh, not to keep us happy. <laughs> so this was uh, an attempt to keep us alive. So now we're trying to outsmart our own evolution a little bit. But this idea of feeling tones. And so every time anything happens to you, uh, there is a feeling tone associated with it. Obviously, major things uh, are pretty, <laughs> they hit you pretty hard. But even when you take your first sip of coffee, oh, this was a good cup of coffee. Oh, this wasn't a good cup of coffee. Pleasant, unpleasant. Mm -hmm. So we'll do a little experiment here. And so I'm just going to run through three scenarios. And for Mark, you, and then uh, all the learners out there, all I want you to do is draw a smiley face or a sad face 
with the feeling tone that hits you uh, when I when I give you the stimulus. So, a weed, <laughs> a weed, pleasant or unpleasant, smiley face or sad face. And again, you don't have to tell me right now. We'll go through all three, and then we'll okay. do a little debrief. <laughs> a red X on your KPI board. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, well, here, so, so I can track the reactions. The first one we had a little bit, we had both smiley and anguish emoji. Um, <laughs> unpleasant, red, angry emoji, smiley face, neutral face. Like to me, I mean, especially, I mean, if it's not my metric, I feel like it's easier to be calm or neutral. Like that, that is a fact that the data is what it is. The rational side of my brain says, hey, let's dig in and work on it. Yeah. Yep. And then the last one, um, your boss asks you a question and you have to say, I don't know. Pleasant or unpleasant? Smiley face or sad face? I mean, like to, <laughs> somebody said, uh, John said what I was going to say, depends on your boss. I was going to say <laughs> depends on the situation. You know, it does. Uh. Do you have a leader who reacts well to I don't know? What's their, if they're green, pleasant reaction to I don't know, you're probably going to feel neutral to pleasant about it. But I see an upside down smiley face. <laughs> so we're getting all the emojis here. We're getting yeah. kind of a discouraged looking emoji. Good boss equals opportunity. Um, and there's the poop emoji. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And so... That's the typical response. There is no good or bad, right? Depending on the situation, depending on where you're at in life, in your own headspace, depending where other people are at. But as humans, we always judge things pleasant or unpleasant. And then oftentimes that starts the chain reaction we call the monkey mind cycle, uh, which actually I, I teach this in a uh, idea of the monkey. Uh, these feeling tones then lead us <laughs> down some path, whether it's a path we want or, or it's a path path we don't want. Don't you, you broke up a little but bit. It's can, always can, going on. Can, can you repeat that? You broke up a little bit about monkey mind. It's kind of this reactive, reflexive. Yeah, yeah. I was saying, uh, I, yeah, I teach this in a, a five session class, and we really dig into the monkey mind. Am I breaking up again? You're okay for now. Oh, okay. I got a little note that my internet was unstable. So, um, but yeah, this idea that our brains label things pleasant or unpleasant just kicks off that cycle. And if left unchecked, it does things that typically we don't want it to do. Our brain does things typically or goes places we don't want it to go to. Let, let, let me ask a question before you move forward to the CI and leadership piece. I've, I've heard some people I know talk about and write about stoicism. Is that, how different is that? And from your reading? Yeah, right. that's a great, uh, yeah, that's a great catch. And because this usually comes up and, and I always forget to put it in here, the point, what, so what I'm saying is not that we shouldn't have reactions, right? Stoicism kind of goes down wow. that nothing matters, who cares? you know, that kind of, that kind of attitude. What we're saying here is we just want to see it, mm. whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. I don't mind joyous or unjoyous suffering or, or happiness doesn't matter. I want to see it. I want to feel it. Okay. Because so not, then I want to deny react. Mm -hmm. I don't want to deny it. That's exactly a perfect okay. way to put That's it. That's very clear. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you asked that. So then my hypothesis, right, if we can sense uh, our feeling tones through presence, right, we have to get good at understanding what's going on in our own skin and between our ears. Before we can re before we react, uh, we can be equanimous, and I'm still not sure if that's a real word, <laughs> and have much better outcomes, better discussion, better debate, all those things that you can imagine will improve 
if you have that pause between stimulus and response. Again, a lot of this isn't new. You know, we've heard that, hey, we should stop, challenge, choose was well, something I learned years ago, right? Something hits you and you stop and you challenge, why am I thinking about it? And then choose your words. And that's exactly what I'm getting at here through this idea of equanimity. The, the dig deeper part is you can't help those feeling tones. You're going to have a reaction and it's okay. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Quick story about this. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the parts of our role, uh, also as we roll out continuous improvement uh, at the day job, uh, are these things called maturity assessments. I'm sure most folks are familiar with a maturity assessment. A team of folks go in and go through 200 questions and out pops a score. Uh, I stood up CI to plant out in California, and about two years in, uh, our assessment team came in to you know, see how they're doing on their journey. Uh, I knew it wasn't perfect, but I was really happy with the ta- with the way the team progressed. I got a call 6.30 in the morning of the second day. Um, uh, it was actually the global CI leader, uh, who was also a part of the assessment, and he said, we need to talk about this plan. I thought, all right. I'm going to get some kudos here. Um, get on the phone. Jason says, uh, this plant is going to have the lowest maturity assessment score we've ever seen. So you can probably guess which feeling tones were coming up for me. <laughs> Wasn't pleasant. <laughs> um, but I caught it immediately. I mean, as soon as those words came out of, out of Jason's mouth, you know, I... I just stopped because I could feel uh, I was feeling all kinds of uh, all kinds of ways and all kinds of things. So I was able to sense it. I was able to just stop, pause, and then immediately say, hmm, "All right, let's go." Have to say, right? What did I miss? And so, if you can get to the spot where that pause is normal and you can catch it, it really is powerful. All right, quick Q and A or Mark, any any follow up there from you? See if there are any questions coming in. I mean, the other thing that just comes to mind, you know, um, something you know, I saw Stephen Covey speak, the late Stephen Covey at a Shingo conference, and you know, he shared an idea you'll hear from others of sort of getting better at increasing the gap between stimulus and response. It sounds, I mean, yeah. I'm curious your reaction to that thought. And I mean, it seems very similar, right? I think it's, yeah, uh, they're, if, if it's a Venn diagram, they're almost on top of each other. Yep, yep. You know, with equanimity, again, I like to point out that the stimulus you can't control and even your immediate feeling tone, most of the time you can't control, but you can catch it, right? And that's going to drive a better response. Uh, we had a, a comment in the chat here from Sandra it says, stop, challenge, choose is new for me and helpful. Ah, great. There's that idea of stop. Yeah, choosing a response. It's yep. not just reacting to stimulus. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Well, good. One gold nugget taken away today. So that's a win. <laughs> and then the third of three, this idea of impermanence impermanent so you know the fancy way to say you know the transient nature of life uh, another way of saying it is everything comes and everything goes right and so i've got some pictures there on the left just to get us thinking about that and you know clouds waves in the ocean come and go every thought you've ever had good bad or otherwise has come and gone favorite pets hopefully some are still here but Lots of come and gone. You know, your favorite boss or your worst boss come and gone. Unfortunately, a lot of people that we love have come and gone. Our favorite jobs or our least favorite jobs. Our best sports team season. <laughs> Go green. That's come and gone, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, if you want to get real heady, you know, the universe, they say. Uh, we'll we'll come and go. Mm-hmm. And so before I move on, uh, where am I going with this? Do you guys think, Mark or or folks there? Type type something in the chat. Where am I going with this? 
Well, there were a couple of comments and I, I don't read Latin, so I'm translating it. Memento mori, which is Latin for remember that you have to die. Yeah. And, uh, oh, thank you, Kevin, for translating it. Amore fati, uh, love your fate. Yeah, yeah. But that's, so does that, well, I want to see the connection to the CI and leadership. Like, Fate, um, that that seems a little, you know, disempowering. If our fate is quality problems, well, mm, maybe that's not our fate. That's maybe that's just something we're suffering through at the moment and we can address. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how you connect those dots maybe to that kind of situation. Yeah, yeah I had to have one little Buddha statue in here. You know, the problem itself can't cause suffering, but it's our attachment that causes suffering. So our attachment to our favorite boss, our attachment um, to the Spartans, Rose Bowl seasons, <laughs> that seemed like forever ago, our, our attachment uh, to a pet, because everything's gonna, everything's gonna come and go. So I'm actually gonna turn this back on you, Mark, before I give any, uh, and listeners, uh, uh -huh. before I give any more. Uh, so the activity on this one, you know, what are you or have you been attached to at work? Uh, continuous improvement or leadership or anywhere that's caused pain because you're so attached to it. So it's a silent reflection, right? Um, you can chime in in the chat if you'd like, but no need, right? This is a oh, silent there's... reflective activity. And unless it's disturbing the silence, there there was a chat. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Well, so I mean, for, well, I, I think I was going to add first was thinking back to the Buddha quote, the word problem sometimes causes suffering because of what's attached to it. Problems are bad. Problems get you in trouble. Um, similar thought, you know, similar things shared by Catherine are old beliefs that red metrics are bad, for example. But again, that, I think that comes back to the thinking, the response from others yep. that we're facing. Good. And so my hypothesis on this one, you know, once we realize or remember <laughs> that everything is impermanent, uh, I say we're at ease with the current state. So if that quality problem um, is really bothering us, know that this wasn't the first quality problem we ever had. And it's not going to be the last, right? The current state is what it is. That's such a terrible saying, mm, but maybe there's a little bit of relevance here, right? If I just completed an A3 uh, and it was terrible, there'll be another A3 <laughs> after this one, right? And there'll be better ones and there'll probably be worse ones. And so I think with impermanence, it allows just that little bit of ease, right? Not everything all the time is the most important thing in the world. It's just not. It's going to come and go. Mm. And so uh, story time with this one, <laughs> it's really less of a story and more about what I really like, uh, some of the more recent movements and continuous improvement and leadership and just thinking about everything as an experiment. Mm -hmm. I think we've done a much better job in our space recently of calling things experiments or tests or trials, knowing that it's going to change. We're going to learn something and evolve, right? We're not holding on to things as true as we used to. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, even some of the uh, lean leaders these days are, are challenging uh, how we roll out continuous improvement, right? Why do, I'm making this up, 90% of continuous improvement initiatives fail. There's something that in this experiment we need to retry, right? And it's okay. It's okay. Lean will come and go, right? Six Sigma will come and go. All sorts of things come and go, and it's okay. Yeah. I suppose with the caveat, as long as we're moving forward <laughs> and trying to do yeah. things better tomorrow than we than we did yeah. today. I mean, yeah, my, my sense of upset over that 90% number will pass. It is impermanent, but I mean, it's, I'm just giving you a hard time, Dave, but it's, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, for what it's worth, I don't know if this connects to this. I've said there's only two states that a quote unquote lean transformation can be in. A, we're still working on it. B, we have stopped. 
So the failure, I, like I mean, what is the, does the failure mean we stopped? Does that mean lean right. failed or does it mean we gave up? Uh, yeah, yeah. Good. There's a comment from Holly here, I think uh, a challenge, continuous improvement versus an instant gratification society. We want quick fix solutions around all sorts of things, right? Very true, very true, yeah, good. Okay. As we go into the holiday season, one thought that comes to mind here is if I'm tempted by a big piece of pumpkin pie, I can remind myself that the flavor and the good feeling is very impermanent. So sometimes a bite or two satisfies that. I just reached Absolutely. that point of I'm done eating pie a little bit sooner. Yeah, yeah, that's a perfect example. And I think there's even there's been some recent surveys that said the anticipation of the first bite is even mm. better than the first bite. So yeah, and, and that will pass, right? And you know what, Mark? If you eat the whole pie, you ate the whole pie, my friend. <laughs> the bad feeling about having done that will pass. It sure will. It always does. <laughs> pass through that number on the scale. But yeah. <laughs> so, you know, just in summary. Um, you know, these three things, and there are a bunch of others, and there are more that, you know, we talk about in the longer version of this. Uh, but with presence, it's just connecting to what's happening right now, really being aware of what's going on inside your headspace, between the ears and inside your body. Use that as leading indicators <laughs> of where of where your mouth might go or your brain might go next. This idea of equanimity, just balance calm, right? Things are only good or bad because we've labeled them good or bad. I think Shakespeare, maybe nothing is good or bad till our mind makes it so, something like that. And so how do we how do we smooth down those rough edges of overjoy or uh, or too much suffering, right? And just realize that it's because we think it's that way, it's that way. And then the idea of impermanence. All the good stuff came and went. All of our best days came and went. All of our worst days came and went. And that will continue to be forever and ever. All right. So I can pause here uh, for any wrap-up questions. I've only got one slide left. And that's kind of a, a continuous uh, education journey. If anybody wants to know kind of what books I've read and podcasts I've listened to, I'll share that. But uh, are there any additional questions here before we kind of wrap up? Well, there's there's a comment, and then I would suggest maybe you can show that. And I have a couple quick announcements, and people can submit questions during that. Um, just a comment from from Terry. This has this has been the best webinar. Uh, could it ha could it have something to do with the hat wearing truck sitting real guy delivering the message? Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry Thank about you, your snow, universe. but yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that experience. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, Kevin said, as a stoic Buddhist, quote unquote, this hits home on many points. But yeah, if you want to share those resources, we'll we'll let questions come in. I've got a couple questions also that I'd like to ask you. You bet. And so, and like any continuous improvement person, I started with books, and I've got several books on here. You know, I don't know that I would say any are better than another. So I challenge you guys take a look at the snapshot of each one and whichever one kind of speaks to you. Uh, start with there. My current favorite, though, is that Peak Mind uh, by Amishi Ja, I think. I'm sure I'm getting her last name wrong. Bottom middle there. Mm -hmm. Great. She does a great job weaving real life stories with lots of scientific data on attention and mindfulness. Um, her, she gives a couple challenges. You know, I didn't talk at all about meditation, or maybe I should have. Um, uh, I do try to meditate. So the way I equate meditation and mindfulness is like uh, going to the gym. You use your muscles all day, every day, even if you never go to the gym, right? But if you're religious about going to the gym or regular about going to the gym, it can help you use your muscles in real life. And that's how I see mindfulness and meditation, right? You can practice everything we just went through without ever meditating, without one minute of meditation. But if you decide to add meditation as part of your regular routine, it will help strengthen your mindfulness practice, right? And so that's how I equate those two. And she speaks to that a little bit in her book there. 
she also leaves uh, readers with a challenge. The next interaction you have with somebody, try to be present for just two minutes. Like, Mark, that's how low the bar is anymore. <laughs> Can we just be present for two minutes with somebody? <laughs> and so that's a challenge to, to everybody here as well. The next uh, conversation you have, just try to be present and feeling uh, your own energy, feeling the energy of the person you're with for just two minutes. So that's that was my my most recent favorite. 10% has a great uh, book, and then a, the app is really good as well. 10% better. 10% happier, yep. 10% happier, sorry, yep. I'm thinking Kaizen. No, 10% <laughs> happier is a good Kaizen. Um, yeah, and so. then Sam Harris has an app, uh, it's called Waking Up, and last time I checked, and I think it's still there, there's a beginner's 40-day meditation like challenge, and I think it was free, where if you're interested in meditation, it's a really great way to ease into it. It's made, it's like the couch to 5K for meditation. Uh, <laughs> so it just starts really easy and, and gets you in there in a, in a 40 day uh, cycle. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. And I do wanna make a couple quick announcements. Our next webinar to wrap up the year is gonna be uh, December 13th. It's going to be presented by two of our customers from UMass Memorial Health. That said, you know, we, we don't want people to say, oh, this is about healthcare. It's not for me if you don't work in healthcare. This is really about um, leadership and continuous improvement. The title of that webinar is Managing Transformation Projects, Improvements, and Learning in a Virtual Environment. Uh, so again, December 13th. Registration for that is going to open up probably on Thursday, speaking of experiments. We are going to do an experiment with a different webinar technology. So everyone mm -hmm. stay tuned about that. You'll receive information about that technology if we end up moving forward with uh, the experiment. But if you want to get notified about future webinars um, as registration opens, you can sign up to get notified at kinexus.com slash webinar. So we'll look forward to uh, Penny Ionelli and Kleena Archambeau um, from UMass Memorial Health we're going to have a lot to share on December 13th. I um, also want to tell you about, if you can advance it, please, Dave, um, our blog, blog.kinexus.com, has something on there almost every weekday. If, if you're looking for um, information and inspiration, we encourage you to check that out. And then one more advance, um, we encourage you to um, listen, subscribe, follow, rate, and review the Kinexus Continuous Improvement Podcast. Um, the audio of this and other webinars um, is in that podcast series, a lot of um, conversations with Kinexians, uh, as we call it, the team members at Kinexus. Um, you can find that in your favorite podcast app. And then if you want to advance to the Q&A, um, Dave's email is davekippen at yahoo.com if you want to reach out um, to him for um, discussion here. So, so Dave, this, this is more of a reflection than a question, but uh, I thought maybe you, you could elaborate. When you talked about um, having the you know the true reflection of I mean, we were talking about presence, um, kind of the true refre reflection, the raw data of the moment. I'm thinking about one parallel of the CI is that if you go and do a site visit at a company like Toyota, there are things you can observe with your eyes, the artifacts, tools, methods. I think what's harder, whether it's thinking of what's inside us. Mm -hmm. Or as was once described um, in an article by a Toyota executive, if you go and visit a plant, you don't see the soul of Toyota was the very specific language that they use, which yeah. we could describe as culture, mindsets. I, I was just, you know, that was my one reflection there. It's harder to think of what's oh, going on yeah. inside yeah. for individuals. Yeah, I've heard the term uh, the hidden factory. So what can't you see to your point? What what's beyond the artifacts, you know? And yeah. sometimes the hidden factory is it's tactical. How do people know what they're working on? But it's also the morale and the and the human side. And you know, the hidden factory of this is yeah, what's going on inside of us as we learn to be more present uh, and understand what's happening. And and I can tell you the the better you get at that, the more you can see it in others just by, again, you know, we all know how to read body language to a point, but there's another layer to this. Uh, I think that's even deeper than just body language. And you start to be able to sense that and pick up on it as you get better <laughs> at uh, 
sensing it and picking up on it in your own body. Yeah. And so to, to that point, one other you know reflection I'll share is, you, know, you talked earlier, Dave, about reacting to things, getting overly wound up. I am guilty of that, maybe more than the average person. <laughs> And I've tried to get better at noticing there, there, there is in a way kind of a physical sensation of, okay, I'm, 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 kind of, I'm getting emotionally ramped up. If I'm typing a reply to an email and I've got that sort of almost tingly feeling in my fingers, just stop. Yeah. You should not be writing an email reply. It might get me in trouble if I feel like I'm in that heightened state. And and it's hard to separate like what's the physical sensation versus realizing, okay, I'm a little wound up. Just, just wait, sleep on it. Pause. And and that's the practice. Yeah. And, and I'll, uh, I'll let you off the hook a little bit. That's what we do as humans. Mm -hmm. And so we all do it. We all react. (laughs) Most of us overreact. And if I didn't say it, I should, I still get angry when somebody pulls out in front of me. Yeah. Some of the time. Um, but I am getting better at just being able to sense it and, and really kind of shrug it off, right? As a as what we say these days. And so, yeah. Mark, even if you find yourself after the fact, <laughs> perhaps reacting in a way you didn't, if you catch that even and reflect and sense on it afterwards, that's a win. Yeah. Because you'll start to move this monkey mind cycle backwards. We catch it too late. Ah, we catch it in the moment. Ah, we're catching it before it happens. And that's what we want to try to work toward. Yeah. And so we have a lot of thank you comments. And, you know, I want to thank you for doing this, Dave. But maybe I want to invite you to share maybe a reflection. This was only happening 75 minutes ago when we first talked. Or I guess you were discovering the Internet problem well before that. Reflections in in terms of your your own mindfulness in the moment. (laughs) facing that stressful situation. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was really interesting. So uh, I have today off uh, heading out West this week, my daughter's getting married. And so today's kind of our prep prep day off. And, and so I, like I mentioned, I planned my day around this. And so I rode the Peloton at 11 because I thought I'll have plenty of time to get set up and, (laughs) and get on this by one and I get off the Peloton and uh, oh, the internet's out. Well, that's strange. I'll just unplug it and plug it back in. Unplug it and plug it back in. Didn't work. Okay. And at this point, uh, my my fantastic wife is running around saying, I I can't watch the show I want to watch. And I can't, the Alexa's not working and all these things. And why aren't you upset? She's saying yeah. to me. I said, Well, we'll either get the internet back on or we won't. Yeah. And it was just like that. And Tried a few more things, didn't work. I had to go take a shower. So just climbed in the shower like normal and, and didn't sweat it. Came back down. Internet still wasn't on. And that's when I, Mark, shot you the note saying, hmm, we may need a plan B here, buddy. <laughs> yeah. uh, and you and I had a, a conversation, came up with a plan. And here we are. You know, it was unpleasant still. I mean, I didn't love it. Um, but I certainly felt like. I handled it. Uh, I handled it in the way that I wanted to. Maybe I'll I'll put it okay. that way. Well, good. And I, you know, I think I felt neutral about it, realizing that there were other plans. We could have had a plan B or C or D. There were options or things we could have done, including well, let's just wait and record it. But what I didn't know was the context of I didn't know or I didn't remember that you were on your way out of town. So for you, it was probably more of a okay today or long wait. Right. As opposed to today versus tomorrow. So right. thank you for right. sharing that context and thank you for um you know suffering through <laughs> the technology <laughs> challenges um because you know it, it worked 98% good audio wise and um I'm I'm glad that plan B worked out. So Dave, oh, thank you again for doing this. I want to thank everybody who attended and, and most everybody stayed on here to the end. So I think that's awesome. a sign of um, a job well done, and there are more thank yous coming in. So uh, again, want to thank our presenter, Dave Kippen. Um, you can reach out to him, Dave Kippen at yahoo.com if you want to yeah. send questions or interact more. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending. Dave, if you like, I'll give you the last word before we sign off. <laughs> uh, think about what your next step is, right? If any of this resonated, even just a little, yeah. What are you going to do different this afternoon or tomorrow, whether it's buy a book or whether it's 
hang a little sticky note next to your monitor that just says be present try something yeah well said okay thanks mark i appreciate it thanks again